Convention has done harm to our movement for animal rights. And I'm really happy to be here today and be part of debunking it because it needs debunking. Uh, I'm gonna start, uh, and I also wanna thank Deborah for that wonderful, moving, beautiful presentation. You know, one of our local sanctuaries here in Phoenix is called Goats with Horns. And, you know, that name, I already understood, you know, the meaning behind it, but now it has an even deeper uh, meaning and resonance uh, for me, that, that name of our, one of our local sanctuaries now. So uh, I'm going to talk today about um, how media represents the humane myth, as my title suggests. And what I'm going to present is a shorter version of a chapter that I've written for the Humane Hoax book that Hope was talking about a few minutes ago. So anything I don't get to today, you'll be able to read about in that chapter when the, when the book comes out. So for the last couple of years, I've been collecting and analyzing news media stories about humane, non-human animal exploitation. My main focus is high caliber outlets like the New York Times and NPR. I feel like it's really important to look at these in particular because many people view these kinds of outlets as the apogee of responsible journalism, objective, responsible, progressive even. When it comes to this issue, they are anything but progressive. And that is what I am trying to show. So that is going to be really my main focus today. I'm gonna to have three main parts to what I'm gonna talk about. The first is going to be a little bit of theoretical background and a few concepts as a lens for what I'm gonna analyze. Then I'm gonna look at some of the media texts and stories directly and analyze them. And then I'm gonna conclude with some recommendations for journalism and just in general for communication about non-human animals in general. So I wanna talk a little bit first about the humane myth or the humane hoax and just what it is and what it's doing. So as the animal rights and the vegan movement has made some progress and we've had made progress, we've all seen the signs that people are waking up and the culture is changing in small ways. Uh, the humane myth is a backlash discourse, a retrograde way of talking and representing non-human animals that seeks to and often succeeds in repositioning the exploitation and consumption of animals as normal and even as ethical. So these designations, it seems like there are new <laughs> ones every week, it's hard to keep up. Humane, cage-free, free range, grass-fed, and so forth. You know, they're not only, so these are persuasive sales pitches when they're affixed to particular products, but they have translated into powerful ideological tools in their own right, apart from their appearance on any particular commodity. And that's what we see in the way that the humane myth is talked about, including in this media discourse that I'm going to look at. So, and what it does is it maintains this cognitive dissonance. You know, many people have misgivings and have concerns about eating animal products. You know, they, they think of themselves as a good person who loves animals. Many people would agree with those two statements about themselves, yet they've seen or heard or read something about the horrible violence and suffering that non-human animals experience uh, in, in the food system. And so in March is the humane myth to sort of maintain that comfort zone, right, between thinking oneself as a good person and an animal lover on the one hand and consuming the products of sentient beings' bodies on the other. Uh, and I just want to say a few words now about the political economy of the media. So one of the most powerful avenues, of course, through which speciesism is instilled and reinforced is indeed through media. And this is about money. We always want to remember that. You know, these are all capitalist outlets that are clamoring for revenues and readership. And I include NPR in this. NPR is one of my main uh, focus, the main uh, outlets that I focus on. You know, yes, they're public radio, but 29% of their revenues come from corporate underwriters. And these have included Cargill, for instance, one of the biggest animal exploiting corporate conglomerates on the planet. Uh, it includes Coke Industries, 
the Walmart family. I mean, it's a bit of a who's who of big multinational corporations. So they are far from free from corporate influence. And the animal industrial complex, of course, is completely interwoven into global capitalism. So that's a foundation that we always want to keep in mind. These structural factors, combined with journalists and editors themselves having been brought up in this culture and been enculturated with uh, dominant values, means that media tends to reinforce the status quo uh, across the board, but it's certainly on this issue uh, on animal rights. Uh, so these, these are just important things to keep in mind. So there are a lot of features that I've noticed in closely analyzing the media stories. I want to break them down into three main categories, uh, umbrella terms. So the first and biggest one is misrepresenting non-human animals. And here I'm going to refer to a ruse of visibility or invisibility in plain sight. Animals are used, shown as props in very human-centered narratives. And this really, I argue, reinforces their objectification because their subjectivity as unique individuals with experiences that matter are completely absent or almost completely absent. Every now and then it like breaks through, but then it's sort of undercut by some other, you know, speciesist, uh, you know, statement. Um, and then the second is, which is very connected with the first, is a rhetoric of care. Exploiters are glorified as benefactors, so that even the, the mere, you know, you know uh, minimal actions that are taken to keep these beings alive to an age when they can be profitably slaughtered, like even feeding or things like vaccines, why would they need vaccines in the first place, is something that is uh, omitted uh, often, are presented as a kindness. And these exploiters are interviewed and express views with very little fact checking or challenge so that they can say uh, sometimes extremely counterfactual things as, as uh, we'll see without any challenge from the journalistic voice. And then the third, again, and this is connected with the others is a, what I call a rhetoric of denial. This means that a lip service being paid to alternative views when they even are presented. For instance, just mentioning the climate or mentioning the environment without going into any detail about, for instance, the absolute environmental disaster that animal agriculture is. You know, the evidence is in, there's no debate about that. Silesh will talk about this later, so I will leave it to his presentation. But they'll just kind of drop it in there and mention it without going into it. Um, and then also the idea that, that slaughter might not be humane occasionally is mentioned, but it's, there's never any debate. There's never really any discussion of it. So it's sort of a denial through mentioning. Like if we just mention it, well, then, okay, we've done our due diligence and we can move on. And also another thing, kind of an aside, is that, you know, these discourses position the reader and the audience, and the audience as non-vegan in some subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways, which I think is, is also important. Okay, so what is the result of all of this? It propagates a pro-animal use messaging on a mass scale, and this props up the whole animal industrial complex because this alternative so-called markets and the regular agribusiness market, it's all one big system, right, that has at its foundation the ideological position that it is acceptable and right to exploit and control other beings for our purposes. So it props up that whole worldview, uh, the humane myth does. And again, tragically, truthful depictions of these animals are missing. And so I would argue that it is, it sets us back. That visibility does not equate to a liberatory discourse. Showing animals does not in itself help them. All we have to do is look at the way women are represented in our culture and in media to see that visibility does not equate to a, a liberatory direction, right, for, for communication and representation. 
So now I just want to briefly talk about uh, the, uh, the concept of the absent referent. So this is an idea that was introduced by feminist author and activist Carol Adams in her now classic book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. So the absent referent is a kind of a process through which animals' identities are erased through a culturally reinforced denial that keeps people comfortable with consuming animal products and separating that product from the beings who were exploited or killed for those products. To quote Carol Adams, behind every meal of meat is an absence, the death of the animal whose place the meat takes. The absent referent is that which separates the meat eater from the animal and the animal from the end product. So to break down the absence, so that was Carol Adams presented that in 1990 in her book, uh, The Sexual Politics of Meat. In 2013, in the Journal for Critical Animal Studies, she broke it down, the absent referent, in order to apply it to this locavore uh, trend that was in full swing then or is still in full swing now, unfortunately. So we have three parts here. I've kind of simplified a bit what she has said. X, Y, Z. X is the literal death or the violence against the animal, the fact of the exploitation. Y is the hiding of that death or violence as con uh, con occurs with conventional products. This is what they're routinely accused of, including by the humane exploiters. And certainly they do hide <laughs> what's going on. And then Z is the objectification part or the lifting of the animal's death to a higher meaning through metaphor and consumption. So viewing the parts of a once living being as you know, legs, ribs, meat, and uh, all, I want to say that although Adams develops this in reference to meat, this applies also, the absent referent applies to uh, cow's milk and, and goat's, goat's milk and dairy overall and to chicken's eggs. The absent referent is also operative there as much as it is with flesh or meat. So in terms of this humane or locavore type of exploitation, the X part of the absent referent is exactly the same as it is in conventional. In many cases, it is even worse. Hope has fantastic materials about this, talking about how humane exploitation, there's just as much animal suffering as there is in any big agribusiness operation, sometimes more. The objectification piece is just the same. These animals are, of course, viewed as commodities for use and, and uh, you know, slaughter and selling. What they claim is different. So the major piece in the rhetorical arsenal of this humane exploitation rhetoric is this visibility piece. They are claiming to show it. They're claiming to show the process. Look, you can come see our farm. You can see our happy animals. You can even see the processes that are going on. You can even grab a knife and come slit some throats yourself if you want as celebrity Farmer Joel Salatin has been uh, said in some of his public materials, you know, something very close to that. So this, this ruse of visibility is a major rhetorical strategy of legitimation in the way that the humane myth is talked about. So I'm going to go to my first media story now, uh, selling ethical meat on National Public Radio. And this, uh, what I'm going to talk about is an interview on NPR, a very long interview with Kamas Davis. Many of you may know who she is. For those who don't, she's a bit of a diva in this, um, <laughs> you know, locavore uh, fad that is going on. She is the author of the book, uh, Killing It. I guess I'll go to my next slide. Here we go. Uh, there's the cover of the book with her in this Machiavellian profile with the cleaver. She's almost always pictured with a cleaver or a knife or some similar type of implement like that. And, you know, the title of this book, the interview on NPR that I'm going to look at was Time to Coincide with the Release of this Book. You know, the, the title, just the title of it is so awful, right, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's objectifying animals through this uh, impersonal pronoun, it. And it's also making a joke out of violence, you know, because it's a play on words like killing it, like doing a great job, like she's doing a great job, like, you know, <laughs> explaining these animals, I guess. Um, 
and yeah, and I'll talk about the education uh, thing in the title later as well. Here's a here's a typical media picture of her. So I just want to so when I talk about rhetoric, because this is one of my areas of academic study, and um, you know we think of that in terms of words and language and speech, but it really images have rhetoric also, right? They have certain persuasive uh, elements to them. So if we look at this, I mean. So everything is so nice and shiny and clean and she's there looking all smiley and blondes and everything and like there's not a drip or mess of anything anywhere and she's smiling with that cleaver and yet there's like someone's leg and foot on the table. I mean how much more objectifying can you get that Z piece of the absent reference that I was talking about before here is a perfect example over it like smiling over somebody's leg and foot, you know, with a, a stamp on it and everything. It's just so horrible. Here's another picture. You know, look at this, like this, you know, nice house, everything's neat and in place and all the books and it looks so nice. And that look, here, made huge pieces of uh, somebody's uh, corpse there, you know, and there's no, but nothing's messy, including her clothes or anything. Okay, so, um, so the interviewer is Terry Gross. She is a veteran journalist, as many of you are, I'm sure know. She's celebrated for her ability to speak to a wide range of people on a variety of topics in a probing and inquisitive way. And certainly she does. I will argue, and you may agree, that on this topic, um, she could have been more probing. I'll, I'll just put it that way. So uh, she introduces the interview, uh, she, the uh, interviewee, who is Kamas Davis, as follows. And I'm gonna focus on the part that I have in yellow there. So, oh, and I should mention what she's talking about, this Portland Meat Collective. So this is the business that Kamas Davis runs. If you go to the Portland Meat Collective's website, you will find a very high priced non-human animal flesh for sale. You will also find the opportunity to sign up to participate in ritualized violence in the form of lamb slaughtering classes and rabbit slaughtering classes and things like that, costing hundreds of dollars per session. So this is aimed at a very elite affluent audience. People wanna say veganism is elitist. I invite them to go to the Portland Meat Collective website and do a comparison and see who is really elitist. Um, anyway. So I want to look at the part in yellow here. So Terry Gross says, uh, some students at the, at the Portland Meat Collective are taught how to kill and butcher chickens and rabbits. You may be wincing at this, Terry Gross says, but Davis thinks that our food system is based on not telling. And that if we eat meat, we should understand the process and try to be as responsible as possible for decisions we make about the meat we buy and how much of it we consume. So one thing I want to point out here is this is a perfect example of that why piece of the absent reference that I was talking about a few minutes ago. If I was going to paraphrase this in a way, it's sort of like, oh, the functioning of the absent referent may have been momentarily destabilized for you, listener, by hearing about little rabbits and chickens being killed and thinking about that violence. But don't worry, Kamas Davis is going to tell you about it. And by telling us about it, it's going to make it okay. It's going to make it ethical. I also just want to quickly point out how this we, I understand you might, why, why you might want to use we here. And I also just wonder if it's also kind of subtly positioning the listenership as non-vegan in terms of like the meat we buy and the meat we consume. It's just something to consider. Okay, so I want to look at this um, passage here, which is from the interview. So uh, Davis says she's asked to explain ethical meat. And to be fair, she's being asked to define an oxymoron, ethical meat, so which may automatically engender confusion in any attempted response. And sure enough, that's kind of what we get. So Davis says, and I'm going to read the whole thing, even though it's a little like, ugh, it's a little annoying, but uh, what she says. But she says, in my own education, I found the more I went into those processes, be it slaughter or whole animal butchery or turning a pig head into a pate de tete. So I want to stop here for a second. Look at this objectification. Uh, this is what animals are. 
for a, a head, a part, and a pate de tete, some food item made from the head of a being. And um, this complete objectification, right? Uh, the more, she says, the more deeply I thought about why I eat meat, how much of it I eat, where it comes from, and the more I was able to assess how comfortable I felt with certain parts of those production methods. And so it's a theory that I've developed over time through my own education, she says, that the further in we go, the better choices we make and the more agency we have in changing that system that brings food to our table. So one thing that stands out here is where are the animals, <laughs> right? A, a head and a pate de tete, and that's about it for, right here. The other thing I want to look at is that this seems to be really about desensitizing oneself to violence, right? This process that she's talking about. And this whole thing about agency to change the system is very deceptive, I would say, and very disingenuous. You know, this is not about changing a system. This is about reinforcing one of the oldest, you know, prejudices and speciesist on, in human history, which is uh, speciesism and animal exploitation, right? They, it's being framed as if it's some revolutionary thing that's moving us forward. It's, try, it's a retrograde idea. It's trying to reinvent some idyllic fairy tale relationship uh, with animals that never existed. And she's celebrating her own agency while ignoring the agency of these animals who have agency and would exercise it a lot more if they weren't being being exploited in these conditions. So, and just the, the last thing I want to point out with this one is this whole language of theory and education. Okay, so as someone who teaches at a university and works with theories, I just, yeah, I like, I don't know what she's talking about. So it just seems like she's using theory to talk about an amalgam of impressions that she has about what she's doing. And I understand we might use the word colloquially that way, but and, and education, you know, her education consists from looking at the book, consisted of watching others, mostly men, exploit animals and then emulating what they did and doing it herself. So it's, it's, it's sort of trying to make this sound really smart and deep <laughs> when I, she's not really saying very much. I, it's just kind of a bunch of smoke and mirrors. So here's an example of what I talked about before about the denial through mentioning sort of dropping something and not going into it. So Davis is asked by Terry Gross to talk a little bit more about her concerns, you know, what with ethical meat, what it means. So she says she's concerned about how land is used to raise the animals. Um, we know that in terms of land use, this is completely unsustainable and disastrous, even more so these free rangey type operations, right? But, but she just says she's concerned about it and Terry Gross doesn't ask any challenging things about that. Uh, Kamas Davis apparently is also interested in whether those animals are allowed to be the animals that they are. Well, any of us who have paid attention to these animals as something other than products know that they can never fully be the animals that they are under these conditions where they are confined and various, to various extents, their breeding and their movements are controlled and they're slaughtered always at a fraction of their natural lifespan because people like to eat the flesh of young and adolescent uh, animals before they get old enough that their flesh becomes tougher, right? How can they be the animals that they are under these conditions? The males are always discarded or killed if it's a dairy uh, operation or an egg operation. We just heard Deborah's presentation about that, so we know that's the case. Uh, and then Kamas Davis apparently is concerned that they're treated humanely. And that in and of itself, she says, that phrase is debated quite a bit, <laughs> but it's not debated in this interview. Uh, Terry Gross doesn't ask her to, about the debate or what the opposing view might be. Okay, uh, so just continuing this complicated puzzle of ethical meats as it's being presented, uh, that's what Kamas Davis calls it, a complicated puzzle. Um, so inputs go in, what happens when the inputs come out? This is another thing you see in language around animal exploitation, this very mechanistic representation of animals as machines, you know, like they're just converters of resources, like inputs go into them and outputs come out of them, you know, like they're a machine or something. 
Um, she's interested in resource management. Again, no discussion of how unsustainable this is in terms of resources. And then look at these completely anthropocentric concerns that are being um, considered part of ethical meat. Uh, is the food safe for us? Do, is it nutritious? Is it delicious? How is that part of ethics? I'm not sure. Um, and then the thing I want to focus on as I go into my next slide is, is her question, do they have a good life? <laughs> well, and then do they have a good death? So from her book, I want to show you an example of what she considers a good death. Now, this is from the first pages of her book, Killing It. You don't have to go very deeply into the book to find this. Um, and when I, I have to say, when I uh, looked at this book, I didn't want to look at it, but I looked at it to do this work. And I kind of thought that she, it would be presented in a way that made it sound humane <laughs> somehow, but it doesn't even do that. I, I think you'll probably agree with me as we look at this. So look at this description. I think these are the very first words of the book, actually, uh, if you open to page one. So she's talking about this, this, this female pig, how big she was. This poor being has been bred to be so oversized that she can barely move. And look at this, the part I have in yellow. The mechanical hand lifted the dead old sow up out of the concrete bath of scalding water and accidentally dropped her from five feet high onto the hard, cold concrete floor. I mean, listen to the coldness of the way this is told and also the coldness of the environment that's being described, how mechanistic it is. How is this any different from a standard slaughter operation? I can't tell so far. And then, and then look at this, you know, this vapid curiosity almost that she describes it with. It wasn't a thud exactly when this poor being was dropped on the floor. It was more of a ripple. Um, her heart was still in there too, though no longer beating. Um, so this man ran over to her body and attempted to push her back into the mechanical hand as if this were actually possible. She's 300 kilos too big. That is about 700 pounds, if I understand correctly. Can you imagine? Um, Mark Chapelard, who along with his three brothers had agreed to mentor me in the French ways of knife and bone, told Kate, my American translator and host, who told me. So, this raises a question of why she had to go to France for this education that's written about in the book, Killing It, because it's in France, when there's plenty of this stuff going on in the United States, and there already had been when she was writing the book. And I was, because she doesn't speak French, right? It's very clear. She has a translator and everything. So I kind of wondered if, you know, the exoticism of this Medi rural Mediterranean environment and these kind of rugged French men that educate her in brutality maybe adds a certain romanticism, a certain je ne sais quoi, I don't know, to the narrative uh, so that a bit of the exotic helps to sell books about locavorism. Maybe that's my theory. Maybe other people have, have thoughts on that. Um, so, and look at this objectifying language. She was done having babies and was going to be turned into sausage. Um, so here is something I really want to look at to see, you know, again, what is considered a good death. <laughs> so the man pressed a button which sent an electrical current coursing through the headphones and into the skin and subcutaneous fat in the bone and the brain of the 700-pound mama who dropped to the floor and began convulsing she's convulsing. How could this be humane? That makes her senseless to pain. This was the most humane way to kill a pig, he said. So by the own admission of this discourse, this is the most humane way. And I think most of us would agree. I, I can't imagine how this could be defined as humane according to any plausible definition of that word. So again, a man had hoisted her up by a chain. He stuck a long knife into the space between the sow's throat and where I imagined her heart to be. There, they are turned upside down and their throats are slit while they're still alive. This is always how it's done, no matter what the operation is. There's no other way because they want to drain the blood out while the heart is still beating. And this is no different, <laughs> regardless of what label is on the product or what smoke and mirrors rhetoric is being put up around it. So here's the last thing I want to look from at from the NPR interview. So 
Um, Gross asks the closest, I would say, that comes to a challenging question, and she does it very gently, but the pig doesn't feel anything when the blood is being drained, Terry Gross asks. And David says, that's the goal and that's the belief. So now we're in the land of beliefs, right? Um, if the pig is not stunned correctly, the animal will feel it. And you'll know pretty immediately. So the whole goal, Davis says, is to keep it, you know, pain free. And I mean, it's, there's a lot of debate about what happens in that moment or whether or not it's, whether or not we can know or not. But, but based on what science exists, that's sort of the conclusion the industry has come to. So <laughs> I don't really know. It's probably not pain free, but this is just what we've decided to believe. And I guess, you know, non-human animals and their experiences matter so little that that's just a satisfactory uh, conclusion to come to. So, oh yeah, one last thing. And those of you who know chickens and, and, uh, and, do, and, and interact with chickens, <laughs> I hope you would comment on this in the comments, uh, maybe, because I'd love to hear your input. So, uh, uh, Davis has asked, what's the, the humane way approach to slaughtering a chicken? Well, Davis says, well, any, really with any slaughter of any species, it's always the same. And in the case of a chicken, hanging them upside down or setting them on their backs sort of turns their brains off. Uh, they just kind of stop moving. And they have these sort of reptilian brains that respond in a way that they just sort of calm down and don't want to move anywhere. And so that's usually the first step in getting them comfortable. Yeah, she says. So <laughs> there is abundant slaughterhouse footage of chickens hanging upside down on the slaughter line and struggling and screaming for their lives in that position. <laughs> so we know it doesn't turn their brains off. If they were to stop moving under these conditions that Davis is describing, and Hope and I dialogued about this in the comments, you know, on my uh, draft, you know, for the book, and it seems like this could, one explanation could be an instance of what Hope has called the ultimate betrayal. Maybe it's because this is the person who has been feeding this animal and they trust them. And so tragically, they don't struggle, they don't realize something terrible is going to happen to them, which really just makes it all the more sad and awful. But this representation of chickens, say, as just machines that whose brains can be turned on and off by being turned upside down, is just crazy. And it's, it flies in the face of all science. Okay, there is abundant information out there now in both the academic press, which I have an example of on top, this amazing article by Lori Marino, who's also an activist. There's many other similar academic articles I could list. I have a huge bibliography. And in the popular media, like this BBC story from 2017 about how, well, we thought chickens were stupid, but guess what? They're not. So there's no reason why a journalist of the caliber of Terry Gross would not have been able to research this a little bit, ask some somewhat more challenging questions than she did. Okay, the next thing I'm going to look at is a story in the New York Times <laughs> that props up dairy. Now, a couple things about this. So this article, it's kind of, it's actually not really an article. It's, a, it's made to look intentionally, to look like a news article, but it is a paid PR piece by the Lando Lakes Company. And it's made by a subsidiary of the New York Times called Brand Studio that makes these, manufactures these type of pseudo articles. So what this does is it literalizes what is actually a pervasive feature of media, which is that there is so much corporate composed content in news media stories that is unmarked and unlabeled and readers are not informed about. All you have to do, there's a lot written about this one handy book on it is called um, Toxic Sludge is Good for You, How Corporations Write the News. <laughs> so even when it's not marked out like this, corporations are influencing the news. Here it's made literal. I mean, it's made, I guess, there's this little disclaimer, I've made it bigger here. If you just looked at it in the paper, it'd be easy to kind of miss, you know, this Lando Lakes brand studio thing. So changing the face of the dairy industry. Now, this, shows, this article shows that this rhetoric of care and this humane myth 
<laughs> facade can now be applied apparently to any type of operation, even if it's a huge industrial one, like the one described in this article. It's not even a little homesteader thing. It's a big industrial dairy operation. And yet everything revolves around the comfort and well-being of our cows is like the big tagline of this piece. Uh, and yet look at these pictures. Here they are crowded in a muddy pen. It, it looks just like a standard feedlot. Do they look comfortable? Or like their care is the, and comfort is the priority? Look at that. Look at over here how crowded and frightened they look with those tags in their ears. And here she is over in her office. You know, that's how it literally is in the article. This is one of the saddest pictures uh, for me. You know, this little baby Meyer examines. So it, 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 the narrative revolves around this female farmer. It's, it's playing on this whole trend uh, of, of putting women front and center now as exploiters and farmers as a way to, I guess, put a kinder, gentler face or, or a pseudo feminist face on such a harmful industry. So here she is examining a newborn calf birthed just hours earlier. If you look at the language, it's actually not even, it could have said something like cares for, I mean, it would have been a lie, but it's not even trying to say that. She's examining her for financially advantageous characteristics, presumably. Look how huge those ear tags, the ultimate, you know, uh, sign of commodification. Look on this tiny little baby. She's there in a stall. There's the feeding, you know, uh, bin and everything. This is just standard exploitative dairy, and yet it's being framed as everything revolving around the, the care. Look what a huge dairy operation this is. 2,600 some odd gallons of milk a day, right? So this is an incredibly huge um, operation that's being promoted as like this big humane, like kind thing. Um, this pseudo feminist rhetoric here, um, you know, a lot of women do this now. <laughs> and um, she doesn't like being called farm wife. She wants to just be called the farmer because she handles the finances and the vaccinations for the 550 head herd, more objectifying language. Um, Oh, it went to my next slide without me doing it. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so main things to notice here, hollow tropes of women's empowerment. This is an industry that could not be more exploitative of female animals. And yet the femaleness of the farmers is being paraded out as some big liberatory moment. The mother status, and this is a cross dairy and egg industry rhetoric. The femaleness of these animals, sometimes it's alluded to like they're called girls in this really demeaning, like uh, trivializing way in dairy or egg advertising. You've probably seen this like our girls, you know, they love to just give up their milk and their eggs for the consumption of another species, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but especially the mother status of these animals, that is something that is not exposed. These are mothers by force. Right? They are raped on a, what's called a rape rack in the industry. It's the same thing in, the, in um, these other operations. Um, so it's just so bitterly ironic, you know, to, to promote this idea of women's empowerment when the femaleness and, you know, uh, what, where is feminism when it comes to the exploitation of cows and hens? I, I uh, invite feminists and I am encouraging feminists to step up and embrace this issue because this is a feminist issue among other things. And exploiters are told, you know, we see families highlighted as it is in this New York Times article. Um, they're told to highlight their own families in PR communications and deflect away from the animals. And again, ironically, that these animals have families that are completely disrupted and destroyed in these industries is entirely ignored. Okay, one last thing. Hey, um, Lisa, Lisa, just to jump in real quick, we've got about five minutes left. Okay, okay. So we've got um, designer turkeys <laughs> in the New York Post. So would you pay $200 for a designer turkey? Such incredibly objectifying language. It talks about women are again highlighted. It talks about, um, you know, customers going out to look at the operations and look at the animals. 
Um, I want to just quickly, so I just want to quickly look at maybe, so you can taste that the bird lived a good life is a big tagline in this article. So the idea of tasting someone else's good life is uh, just such an absurd um, concept, but it's presented just in all seriousness here. Um, I saw them in the wild, one customer says, who lives an hour from the farm. They all ran toward me. They were just so beautiful. So looking at these beings and seeing their beauty and yet presumably being like, oh, kill that one for me for my Thanksgiving table. I, I don't know. The cognitive dissonance there is just really astounding. Okay, so, oh no, don't freeze up now, PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, my PowerPoint is freezing up. Um, okay, can I just have a minute? Can I have a minute to reopen it? Of course, do what you need to do. Okay. Uh, I was afraid this would happen. Okay, it's just gonna take a second. Oh my goodness. Um, you know what? Maybe I can just conclude without it. I think I remember. I mean, I'd like to have it, but. It's okay, there's time. Is there time? Do I have a minute to just kind of. Well, you still have four minutes and we can go a little bit into the, um, okay, into so the stop, you know, stop break. Stop. That's okay. Okay. Do what you need to do. Hmm. Oh gosh. All right. Um, okay. Do you need help? Well, it's sort of on my end with my computer. So, cause I have, yeah. Um, okay. Oh my goodness. Uh, Uh, I'm trying to make it work. Mm. Okay, um, well, okay. Someone's suggesting to try clicking shift, control, delete. Yes, that, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm doing that now. Oh my gosh, my screen just went blank. Uh -oh. um, can you see me still? Yeah. Oh, you can see me still? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, my screen is blank. So I, I guess the only thing I can do right now is attempt to conclude. I'll just include, conclude without my PowerPoint. So I want to conclude with some recommendations for journalists to make the perspective of non-human animals present in these stories, because according to the uh, social responsibility theory of the press, news stories, and this is in the AP literature, news is supposed to represent the perspectives of everyone affected by the stories that it reports on. And it's time to include non-human animals in that. And I also want to propose, in, in terms of rhetoric, an idea of uh, rhetorical unity. There's an idea of rhetoric or public communication creating unity amongst human groups. I want to argue for a unity that is not fractured arbitrarily along species lines and includes all the sentient beings affected by the news stories uh, that it reports on. Oh, I'm back now. Um, okay, I'm going to, can you see my PowerPoint? No. We see you. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, we see your screen now. Okay. Okay. All right. You know what, are we at the end of my time? We're at the end of my time, aren't we? That's okay. Do you want to go to your last slide or something? Go I, 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 I would like to, if I can, yeah. can you see my slide now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Your okay. slide show from the beginning. So I'm going to go, I, I'm actually going to go to the current slide because. Oh yeah, though yeah. no, that's better. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's what, cause here, so a modified version of rhetoric, of rhetoric, so a rhetorical identification. 
So if, like I was saying, if rhetoric makes human unity possible, and the, uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Burke is a famous rhetorical theorist, I propose a post-human rhetoric that recognizes interlocking non-human human oppressions and aims for a more inclusive unity, like I said, not fractured along species lines. So I'm arguing for an anti-species as feminist uh, point of view. And again, about me, if you want to get in touch with me, please email me at lbarka.asu.edu. Um, I also am a musician and I play music. I just played at a benefit for Goats with Horns Sanctuary last night and it was amazing. It went so well. So check out my music if you want at scarletrescue.com. And if you want me to come like play at an event and stuff, I can kind of rock the house like vegan style. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, okay, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I'm very grateful to have been a part of this today. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. <laughs> thank uh, you. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to the chapter uh, that you'll be writing for the Humane Hoax Anthology as well. Thank um, you. Yeah, no problem. All righty.